This video is designed to review uh, key ideas about the United States involvement in World War I. In the first decade of the 20th century in the United States, um, there's rapid uh, industrialization. However, the economy is starting to fall just a little bit. There's a minor panic uh, in 1901. Uh, this is also the decade of um, the peak of immigration to the United States in American history, um, particularly those coming from Eastern and Southern Europe, Italians, Greeks, Slavs, Poles, etc. Um, the United States is becoming an ever-increasing urban nation. People are moving into the cities, not only from rural areas, but also you have African Americans in, during the what we call the Great Migration. Uh, the United States will become an urban country uh, by the 1920 census. So that, that's some of the contextualization about what's going on uh, when World War I breaks out in Europe. And of course, uh, historians, we typically refer to uh, the acronym MAIN when talking about why do we have uh, involvement uh, in the outbreak of World War I. These are long-term causes of militarism, um, an arms race really, the entangling alliance system, imperialistic and nationalist um, uh, rivalries, particularly the economic rivalry between Great Britain and Germany. But of course, the, um, the match that lit the powder keg, so to speak, was of course the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand um, and you know the alliances uh, conflict uh, between um, various European alliances. The United States, however, once war breaks out in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson says that we must be impartial in thought as well as deed, kind of harkening back to the United States um, proclamation of neutrality in 1796 by, of course, George Washington um, in the midst of uh, the Napoleonic Wars. So why does the United States remain neutral? Well, we're kind of conflicted between um, differing loyalties about 30 million Americans could claim German heritage um, and, and more could claim British or French heritage. Uh, we have stronger cultural ties and economic ties to Great Britain, so that was more of a long-term cause, our strong economic ties with Great Britain, and much less than with uh, Austria-Hungary and Germany. Um, and there's several events that are going to lead us to um, the United States entering the war in 1917 on the side of the Allies. So let's take a look at those. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of them, just a couple of key points. There was, of course, the Zimmerman uh, telegram that was sent in March of 1917, um, where, of course, Germany tried to solicit um, Mexico's involvement in siding with the Central Powers and Germany would help Mexico reclaim its lost territories. That, of course, was intercepted uh, by the British. Now, there's some theories that it was, you know, hyped up on the British side and it was uh, not actually sent by the Germans, but that was um, a more immediate cause. You also have the Russian Revolution uh, and the withdrawal, withdrawal, I'm sorry, of Russia from uh, the Allied sides. But of course, the number one would uh, would be um, the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare on behalf of the Germans. Uh, remember that the Lusitania was sunk in 1915. You also have the Sussex uh, being sunk. Those were passenger ships. When the United States gets involved, we need to mobilize our efforts. And the United States at the, at the start of World War I was, you know, shamingly unprepared for war. Our military was like 10th in the world. Um, we had a standing army of less than 100,000 uh, soldiers. It was, we were not prepared. Um, and businesses were initially hesitant to meet what Congress was asking them to meet in terms of quotas for, you know, um, building tanks and bombs and, and, and other stuff. 
Um, so that led the United States government and, and con Congress to create the War Industry Boards. And that was ran by Bernard Baruch. Um, he oversaw and set quotas and controlled access of raw materials to uh, different companies like Ford who were asked to produce uh, tanks. Uh, and Ford was initially hesitant to produce tanks because they didn't want to reduce their own domestic production of uh, Ford cars. Uh, however, they, um, through the war industry boards, they were uh, going to be slapped with some fines uh, and was severely painted as unpatriotic if they did not meet those quotas and, and you know, do their duty on behalf of the United States economy. You also have the Food Administration led by Herbert Hoover and the Fuel Administration led by Harry Garfield. Both of those were designed to preserve uh, and conserve food. So you have um, the uh, discussion and advocation of Victory Gardens and Wheatless Mondays. Um, and also energy conservation, fuel in particular, uh, like uh, not only coal, but also oil, oil being uh, more important. In relationship with labor, during war, you do not want to have a labor, labor strike because that, that would severely limit your ability to supply and adequately equip uh, your soldiers actually on the field. So the United States government created the National War Labor Board, which was designed to mediate disputes between labor and, um, you know, corporate management. And during this time period, workers and labor unions actually got more respect and better wages. They finally won the eight-hour workday for um, like factory industries, and they were guaranteed the right to unionize. So finally, during this time period, because of World War I, you have uh, unions making a lot of gains and workers making a lot of gains um, that they had been fighting for ever since, you know, 1870s when these organizations like the Knights of Labor, like the AFL, had been fighting for. In terms of increased government involvement in um, society, they really needed to focus on shaping public opinion and garnering support for the war. And the use of propaganda through various propaganda posters and, and ads and so forth was directed by the Committee on Public Information. Now, this was led by George Creel, and George Creel was rather um, vicious in his pursuit of patriotism. And he was not afraid to use intimidation tactics and to paint others, particularly industries and, and, and companies, but also various groups of people like the Irish or the Jews and the Germans uh, for being unpatriotic. Um, there was a group known within the CPI as the Four Minutemen who made public speeches advocating for the war effort. Um, through the CPI the direction, you have independent organizations like the National Security League and the American Defense Society. These are interest groups or really non-governmental organizations that actually aided the government in spying on their neighbors for those who were not seen as patriotic and reporting those people to the government. You can pause this video and look at some symbolism for um, and, some, and some meaning for some propaganda posters. You can also Google some and give me some ideas about uh, important symbolism to note for World War I. One of the more important um, responses by the federal government uh, during World War I was to restrict freedom of speech in order to protect the patriotic sense of the war effort. And they passed the Espionage and the Sedition Acts. Um, this allowed the federal government to fine and to imprison and to severely limit freedom of speech to those who obstructed the war effort by avoidance of the draft. Uh, they tended to target those groups and those uh, organizations like the industrial workers of the world, the Wobblies, as they were known, and socialists, who were vehemently anti-war. Uh, uh, Eugene V. Debs was actually imprisoned for 10 years because of his anti-war efforts. And of course, you need to uh, pause and, and 
read the article about the United States Supreme Court case, Schneck versus the United States. This one, in this Supreme Court case, the big idea and the outcome was that government can limit free speech when it posts, when that speech posed a clear and present danger to the nation or to the safety of the public. That's why you can't yell bomb on an airplane as a joke because that would incite panic. There is a clear and present danger of doing that. So in that case, your freedom of speech is somewhat limited in this, in the, for the sake of security. And during uh, war, we're also going to use this um, and restrict free speech during World War II to protect um, the war effort. Woodrow Wilson's plan for peace was to avoid future wars, and he does this through the creation of his kind of 14 talking points. You don't need to know all of them, but the first five are really about um, freedom of the seas, free trade, to prevent war forever. No secret treaties, because that was one of the causes for World War uh, I. The next eight are all about self-determination of ethnic groups. And the 14 point, the most important one, was advocating for a League of Nations. This was most important to Wilson uh, because this organization would resolve diplomatic crises and avoid war. So Wilson brings his, his talking points uh, to the Treaty of Versailles, and unfortunately, the other allies of Germany, France, and Italy reject the first points, uh, 1 through 13. They do end up adopting the League of Nations to the Treaty of Versailles, uh, but the reason why they reject the other ones is that they really want to make Germany pay for the war. They want to punish and humiliate them. Uh, most importantly, the key point in the Treaty of Versailles was creation of the League of, Nation, of Nations, but the war guilt clause, which forced Germany to accept sole responsibility for the war. They lost all their colonial possessions. Germany wasn't even invited to the peace negotiations. Russia was also excluded. Um, and um, the treatment in how we punish Germany in a Treaty of Versailles does contribute to the economic depression in Germany and also the rise of um, the, the ultimately the Third Reich of ultra nationalist groups who uh, and and anti uh, feminist uh, sorry uh, anti uh, Jewish uh, notions to uh, kind of shift the blame really. Last point: um, What was the United States' response to the League of Nations? The uh, Treaty of Versailles is not ratified by the U.S. Senate, and that's mainly because of uh, the entangling alliances that the League of Nations would require the United States to join in. Um, and it was eventually, um, ultimately, rejected by the U.S. Senate, and we do not join the League of Nations. Post-war unrest. In the 1920s, the economy is expanding rapidly. However, there is considerable um, and widespread um, fear of the spread of communism, and we call that the Red Scare. Um, that what allowed um, George Palmer uh, to create um, the Palmer Raids, in which um, was designed to attack and, and uh, prevent the spread of communism and communist sympathizers. There's a video that you need to watch, as well as a huge nativ nativist sentiment um, and uh, that is really upheld and, and kind of a showcase in this trial of Sacco and Vanzetti. So you need to watch that video as well. All right, I hope that helps you with some big ideas about the United States surrounding World War I. Have a good day.